speaker is a consultant at InnoQ and a full stack developer. She's also an awesome sketch note artist, so you can follow her on Twitter and see the amazing sketch notes she has been uh, drawing for, uh, for this conference. Today, she's going to show us her design process to cut back on time spent setting up new front-end projects in a quest to easy, reusable, accessible, and not as important, beautiful web components. On stage, Joy Heron, with web components designing front ends for usability. Hi, everybody. Is my mic working? I'm really happy to be here today. My name is Joy Heron. Um, and today I'm going to be talking with you all about web components. Today I want to share my journey with you all, my journey as a software developer. And when I was getting started with software development, I considered myself to be in the stack overflow generation, which meant that whenever I needed the answer to a problem, I would just go look it up on Stack Overflow and figure out how to do it. Uh, that's nothing against Stack Overflow. But the problem with my approach was that I would ask the wrong question. I would ask, how can I do something? And not, why do I want to do this thing? Or even, is there a better way to do what I want to do? Um, and for this reason, when I was getting started as a software developer, I started developing web applications, but I absolutely hated front-end development. I thought it was extremely irritating, and I never, ever wanted to do um, front-end development ever again. However, as I um, grew as a software developer and as I learned more about the how of the web, why does the web work the way it works, um, and what is the architecture of the web, I fell in love with the web all over again. And I also developed a system for myself about how to conceptualize uh, front-end user interfaces and how to design them, um, it, how to design them so that I can uh, not get really frustrated all the time. And that's what I want to share with you all today: is the design process that I've created for myself uh, to think about these problems that we have when we're designing user interfaces and turning them into uh, code. So my journey begins in the spring of 2016 when I was asked to develop a web application containing something that looked like a table. Um, and this table, there were these, there was some, I needed to be able to have some text fields so I could filter the data and be able to sort the different columns. Um, this is going up against a Neo4j, da Neo4j database, uh, but that's not really the point. Um, and after that project was completed, I thought, oh, that's nice, I learned something. Maybe I'll be able to use this in a couple years. And lo and behold, in the summer of 2016, barely three months later, I was asked to, in a completely different domain, program a web application showing data as an HTML table with some filter criteria. In the spring of 2017, I was asked again to develop a web application presenting data as a table with some filter criteria and be able to sort the data. This is going up against a Cassandra uh, data store just a short side note, never use Cassandra for this use case. It's absolutely horrible for this. If you want to know why, feel free to come up and ask me in the break. Um, I much preferred in the winter of 2017 when I was asked to program an HTML table with filter criteria and, and be able to sort the columns. That was going up against a solar data store, and solar is excellent for this use case. If you want to know why, feel free to ask me in the break. Um, <laughs> And then in the fall of 2018, it was last fall, in a completely different domain, different project, I was again asked to program an HTML table with some filter criteria um, and be able to sort the columns. And at this point, I'm asking myself, OK, what's going to happen in the future? Why am I always implementing exactly the same thing in pretty much every project that I've ever worked on? Um, the thing is, is I come from, uh, I'm a full stack developer, 
and I, I have done a lot in the back end, and in the back end, I wouldn't do this to myself. Um, <laughs> when I realize the, in the back end that I'm, I'm using, reusing some functionality over and over again, I might copy it once, um, and I might copy it twice, just so I get an idea of, like, am I really reinventing the wheel or uh, so I can avoid premature abstraction? But then, after I've copied it a couple times, I find that abstraction. I find what's, what's similar between these different implementations, and then I find something that I can reuse between projects so I don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. In front-end development, we can do the same thing. Um, and the technology that we're going to use, I'm going uh, to be talking about it later, is web components. That's one technology we can use. So what abstraction do we have in this case? Um, on the right-hand side, we see this front-end uh, component, which I've copied literally on the slide multiple times. So that means it must be similar between the different applications. Um, and this, when I type things in these filter boxes, um, what I want is I want to send an HTTP request to the server, and the server will do something. I add some query parameters to filter the data, and the... Um, the, the server will say, oh, cool, uh, I'll filter the data, and then I'll give you a new table. And then I, uh, in this way, have an interactive component. So here on the uh, left-hand side, here's our little server. Uh, we can imagine uh, in the Rails app, this is the index, we already have this table of data, and we can extend it with just a few filter parameters to get this behavior that we want to get. So now we can build it with web components. And that's exactly what I did. I built this web component. Um, I called it Tabella, uh, for those who know German, or even who don't. Um, it's, it's like a pretty table. That's what it sounds like in English. Tabella. It's, um, it's a pretty table. Uh, and that's what I want to talk with you all today. So I'm binding my experience and my design process for developing web components onto this example uh, to kind of visual, so to help visualize the intricacies of what I'm talking about. Um, and the first question that you probably have is, what is a web component when I'm talking about web components? Well, the basis and the foundation of every web component is the HTML markup that I'm writing. And my keyword when I'm talking about developing HTML is that I want to make it work. And I also wanted to make it work for all users. So not only people who, can, who are using a mouse on my web browser, but also those who are using a screen reader or are using their keyboard. Um, and it is possible to make websites with only HTML, which is pretty awesome. But we're probably going to have CSS as well in our web component, because even though it's possible to create web, web components with only HTML, most of the time, we want them also, additionally, to look nice and not look like a web page from the 90s. So we can add CSS to our web component to make it pretty. On top of this, kind of as the icing on the top of the cake, we can add JavaScript to improve our web component and make it a little bit better, maybe make it a little bit more interactive um, and add some functionality that might not be there with the base HTML. But this is a point that I really want to make, that at the end of the day, when it comes to designing our web components, we should start with HTML, because even if we're rendering our components on the client, um, we're still rendering the HTML. We're still rendering HTML and CSS, which the user has to interact with. We never interact as users in web pages. We never interact directly with JavaScript. We're always interacting with the JavaScript over some HTML markup that we have written. Um, this is also it could be a little bit confusing because I'm defining in web components as being composed of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the thing is, is that there's also the web components specification for JavaScript, uh, which are, is very, I'm going to be touching on some of those um, items later in the talk. But um, with this, I don't like that there are the web co component specifications for JavaScript, because that implies that that HTML and CSS have nothing to do with web components, and I just disagree with that. So web component specifications for JavaScript, that's custom elements, shadow dome, template, um, and the part of the specification that's already deprecated. Um, those are also very nice, but when we're developing 
uh, web components, the, the foundation is HTML um, and CSS. With web components, the single responsibility principle is also very important because each component that I should develop, I sh it should do one thing, and it should do this one thing really well. And if I need more functionality, I can just write a new component and either put the components next to each other, or if they're really related, uh, I can um, encapsulate them in each other. I can compose them together. This is another benefit of the HTML first approach because HTML composes naturally. It's a markup language, um, and the markup language by default has the parent um, tags, and then all of the children come inside the parent tags. So we have a natural composition. The next question is, how can we find web components? So here we have the same um, uh, picture I was talking about before. And we can look for pieces of our user interface which repeat themselves. For instance, this filter field uh, component where the user is going to type something in uh, as a filter criteria. Um, or these arrow buttons, that's something that repeats itself more and more. And we might have some bigger components that wrap um, our smaller components and tie them together and provide some nice layouting, and a big component around um, all of our components tying everything together. So here, I said we're going to talk use this as an example, so we can look at our first component, which will be this filter field component. And what we want to do is we want to make it work. So what do we need? We need a uh, text box with which we can type into. And at the end, we want to generate an HTTP request with these, this information that the, the users inputted mapped to query parameters. So how can we get this? Does anybody know? It's not a trick question. We can use an input type text element or like a select element to get this behavior. Um, and the cool thing about how HTML forms work is that later, if I wrap it in a form, once I submit the form, um, I, the name or the value of the input element will be mapped to the name of the input element as a query parameter. I think this is really cool, and I had a master's in computer science before I actually learned this. So it's, even though it seems trivial, it's not something that is common knowledge for everybody. So I have a component that works, but is it accessible for all users? Um, and here, my tip is, is we want to make sure our component can be used in a screen reader, we should actually use a screen reader. One excuse for not using one is that we don't have one, but they're really easy to install. And if you're running like on a Mac, you probably already have one installed um, on your system. And if you're using any other operating system, there are screen readers, free screen readers available that you can install. The other excuse is that it's hard, and that's true. Um, it's hard to learn something that we're not used to doing. But if we have the time to focus on accessibility, uh, we, should take, uh, we should look into it because I believe it's worth it in the long haul. Concerning accessibility, I think it's also important when we spend some time working with these tools, like working with a screen reader, so that we don't break the user interface um, because we're trying to make be able for us with our limited knowledge of screen readers to be able to use the screen reader um, we should learn how to use a screen reader before we uh, break our user interface. The thing is, is that the basic commands for navigating a screen reader aren't that difficult to figure out. I also highly recommend this book on the left-hand side for reading up about accessibility. Uh, it's called Inclusive Design Patterns, and uh, I found it extremely helpful. So let's try it out. Let's see how our component sounds. Uh, in a screen reader. Um, I hope the audio is working, and then we can listen to the voice. Edit text. You are currently on a text field inside of web content. To enter text in this field, type. To exit this web area, press Control, Option, Shift, Up Arrow. So here we can see that the, um, the screen reader will tell me edit text, but it doesn't tell me what, it's, what is going to happen when I edit the text in this field. So what can I do? I can use the age area label attribute in my HTML um, input element, and then uh, add uh, context information to my text box. For instance, filter column one. Then it sounds like this. Filter column one, edit text. 
You are currently on a text field inside of web content. To enter text in this field, type. To exit this web area, press Control, Option, Shift, Up Arrow. So now we know not only that we want to edit text, but we know that by editing the text, we will be able to filter column one. So now we have HTML, uh, an HTML component that works for all users, and we want to make it pretty. Um, but here I've added a question mark after making it pretty, not because I don't believe that we should make it pretty, but because of the fact that CSS is harder to override than it is to, to write. I've had this experience working with other um, libraries um, very often that when there's a very hardcore CSS implementation of, uh, from the library that I'm trying to integrate, it's really difficult to um, modify that implementation so it looks like my website. So for me, my tip is, is that I'm, if I'm going to be using it in multiple different projects, I use minimal CSS to make it easy for me to override my styles later and to make it work with my design system. So for now, all I want to do is I want to add a CSS class to my input elements so that uh, it, they're able to, I'm able to give them styles later in other projects. Now we have an HTML element that works and is accessible for all users, and someone else can make it pretty in the future. The question is, is what about JavaScript? I said that JavaScript is also a part of a web component, but in this case, there's not really any need for any more interactivity. Um, so right now I'm just going to say uh, JavaScript, we're OK. We don't need JavaScript in our, in our actual component itself. The second component that I want to talk about today is this arrows component you can see on the, uh, with the yellow arrow around it. And we want to make it work. So what does that mean? Here I have a little animation of what uh, the functionality I want to uh, have for my little component, which is that I want to select one of the arrows, and only one of the arrows. And then from this, I want to generate an HTTP request with the sort behavior or that will be um, implemented for the column. So how can we get it? Does someone know an HTML element that has exactly this behavior? Radio button, radio button excellent. Um, this is exactly the behavior that we have for a radio button. So if I write a radio button, uh, so an input element of type radio with the name sort, and then I have another radio button also of the name sort um, of type radio, then I can only ever select one of these two elements um, and so later, when I wrap it in the form, I also get the same exact behavior that I want, that is that the uh, radio button which is selected will be sent as a query parameter to the server and tell me what sort um, direction I want to use for my table. I also want to make my component accessible, so let's hear how it sounds for a screen reader. Sort column one ascending, radio button, one of two. You are currently on a radio button, one of two, inside of web content. So here we can see uh, what it sounds like for a screen reader. It tells me not only that it's a radio button, but also that when I click on this button, it's going to sort the column, first column ascending, which is exactly what I want. So now I have my HTML, which is accessible for all users, and I want to make it pretty. Um, with styling input elements like a checkbox or a radio button, one of the cool things is, is that I can select the input element by clicking on its HTML label. Um, and what this means is, is that I can visually hide the radio button itself, and then I can style my, um, my labels to look like arrows. So here's the CSS, some CSS you can use to move, like to hide it, not use uh, display none, but to hide it from the visual users, so it moves it off screen but keeps it available for screen readers. And I can use this in my CSS. So for my radio button, which has a class arrow, I, I hide that and move it off screen. And then for the um, arrow ascending and arrow descending um, classes in CSS, I can add, I can style the before element to make it look like uh, an arrow. So this is what it'll look like on the bottom. Um, uh, I see a little arrow in front of my in front of my label, and uh, that's pretty good so far, so good. But I also want to style um, 
based on the hover behavior. So when I hover over it, I don't want to just remain gray, but I want to add, make it turn a blue color. And when it's checked, I want um, it to be a dark gray color. So I can do that because of the cool plus operator in CSS, which allows me to style my label element based on the state of the element which, element which directly precedes it in the HTML document object model. So because my input element directly precedes my label element, I can write CSS rules, which will change the color of my labels or color of the before element of my labels so that uh, this I get this behavior without, um, yeah, it's so that I get this behavior. So whenever my arrow is, is checked, then it will show up as being dark gray. The next thing is, is that I don't want, I want to, I know I want to put this in a column header in my table, so I also want to visually hide um, my labels, and I can move them off screen with the, like, by wrapping them in a span with a class visually hidden. At this point, I double check my accessibility. Um, I'm not going to play any audio for you, but you can double check me if you don't believe me, but it sounds exactly the same. So I have HTML that works for all users and is also pretty. And here, um, the question is again, do I need any JavaScript to make it better? There is an interactive element, that is this checking behavior, but that's taken care of by the HTML, and I'm able to provide this coloring of the input element with only CSS. So for the JavaScript part, we're OK for now. Before we move on to the next component, I want to talk a little bit about templating engines. So when we're developing our components, we've seen we've developed HTML snippets up to this point, and we could just copy them between projects. But this makes it difficult to maintain them over time, because even if I only change the, the CSS class for my component, or if I add an attribute, I have to change that in all the instances. So to improve on this, I can use a templating engine as an abstraction for my component so that I can change it once in one place in my project, and it modifies all of the instances. This is e makes it easier to maintain my components over time. Um, and I can also publish these templates that I write um, using some mechanism, maybe an NPM library or some other means, so that these templates can be used in another project. So this is what that would look like. On the left, we see what this would look like as handlebars. Um, uh, handlebars uh, partials. I don't think it's important which um, templating engine you use at this point, but it's helpful to use a uh, templating engine because then we can just um, use the components as we see on the right. Uh, the same goes for our errors component. We can wrap it in um, we can wrap it in a template and reuse it across a project. The third component that we have is this, um, this header component, this header column header component, where we're going to be um, making sure our components are the way we, like, layouted the way we want them to be layouted. So we want to make it work. And here, because we're grouping them together, basically, so that's what I did. I threw them inside a div, and this is what it looks like on the right side. It's obviously not pretty enough yet. Um, but let's see if it works. There's a problem with this implementation, and that is um, what it will sound like in a screen reader. So let's listen to it. Column one. Sort column one ascending, radio button, one of six. Sort column one ascending. Sort column one descending, radio button, two of six. Sort column one descending. Filter column one, edit text. Column two. You are sort column two ascending, radio button, three of six. Sort column two ascending. Sort column two descending, radio button, four of six. So I hope you got a sense for what the problem is, that if I want to move like to column two or column three or column five, I have to move through all of the input elements with a screen reader. I don't have a choice. I have to like go through every single one and try like um, and, and try to get to the filter possibility that I actually want to get to. But I can improve this by using the role group attribute in HTML, which will group my input fields together and add a navigational level to the screen reader. So what does that look like? Here we see we've added role group 
um, to our div uh, container and also added the area labeled by attribute. I mentioned before area labeled, area labeled by is very similar, but instead of adding the label as text directly, I reference uh, an ID of a um, HTML element somewhere in my DOM, which is then my label for the group. So this is what this will then sound like. Column one, group. So it tells me it's a group, and then I know, in, with a screen reader, I know I can navigate. So with voiceover, that would be with the right arrow. Um, and then I get to the column two. Column two, group. And if you I are would, currently on a group inside of web content. And then, at that point, if I want to move into the, uh, into the, I into the content of the group, I can do that with a screen reader and then uh, listen to the different elements that I have available. Column two. You are currently on a text element. Sort column two ascending radio button. Sort column two ascending. Sort column two descending radio button. Four of six. Sort column two descending. Filter column two edit text. So this adds this navigational level means that I'll be able to navigate much better throughout my application. I have an HTML element that works for all users. But it's definitely not pretty yet. So, let, I mean, by that I mean the layout's not right yet. So let's make it pretty. Um, does anybody, th anybody here know the game Whack-a-Mole? Yeah, few people. Okay, that's the game where you hit the mole on the head and then it pops up back up at you, and it's really frustrating. And I don't understand why anybody likes the game. Um, <laughs> but does anybody in this room have a, has ever programmed CSS? Okay, of those people, has anybody ever been frustrated by CSS? There you go. <laughs> the thing is, is that that's one of the reasons I didn't like front-end development is that I didn't like CSS. It was really frustrating whenever I wrote CSS for, for something. I felt like I broke something else in my application, and I felt like I was playing whack-a-mole, so I would like Right, spend all this time making it pretty, and then it would just pop out in some completely random spot. Or I'd, op I'd make the browser bigger, and the elements would fly all over the screen. And it was really frustrating. But now, luckily, there are CSS rules which make this so much easier. So my tip for you all is that we should design our CSS like a box of chocolates. We should design our container with love, and then we can just place the elements or components that we've de designed inside of our, um, of our com container. The keywords here are either use Flexbox or Grid. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about Flexbox here, but I will be uh, going into a little bit more about how CSS Grid works. CSS Grid is amazing. Um, so is Flexbox. Uh, so let's look at how we can use CSS Grid to, as a layout for our component. Here we see uh, at the top what we currently have. We have the arrows. They're just uh, underneath our header um, title of our column. And what we want is we want to design a container. So the arrows come to the right-hand side. They each have their own little box in our grid. And the header area should span two rows. And the search area should um, span the width of the container. So how can we do this in CSS Grid? we can use the property display grid. And then the grid, we can use a grid, define grid template areas. And this basically looks the same as we see on the left. So we, had, we said before we wanted a header that would span two rows. So in the two rows of our grid template areas, we have the header area. The search should span the width of the column. So, so span two columns. So we have two, the search area spans two columns. We can kind of see that in the grid areas. And then we have the area with arrow ascending and arrow descending areas. We can also define the width of our columns uh, using CSS grid. So the right-hand column should just be as wide as it needs to be based on the width of the arrows. So it gets the width of auto. And then the left-hand column can use this nice, cool um, unit, the FR unit, which will proportionally take up as much space as it's allowed to take up. So if I have one, one FR, it will take up the whole width, that it, as, it, as much uh, space as it can. And for instance, if I were to have two columns with, two, like, with each one having one FR, uh, one FR they would, uh, they would spit, like, split the, the uh, width proportionally amongst themselves.
So now, I said before, we want to design our container with love, and now we just want to place our components inside of our container. We can do that by just setting the grid area for our different components. So for the header area, we set the grid area header, do the same for the arrow ascending and arrow descending, and for the tabella input uh, component, which we defined before, we set that to be the grid area search. When we do this, this is what we get which looks pretty good. So I added here on the, on the left, I added the classes that we defined in our CSS. And it looks pretty decent, except for one small thing, which is that I want to center my column one vertically inside of the header. Almost there. Historically, this was really difficult to do in CSS whenever anybody said, please center this thing vertically inside this container. It was like, oh. No. But now with CSS Grid and Flexbox, vertical alignment is finally easy. Um, so in order to center my text vertically inside of the header, I can just add the align self center uh, property to my header CSS. You can also wrap it in an HTML template so I can reuse it in my application. And I have my HTML component and my CSS so it works and it's pretty. Um, here, with the JavaScript, I would say, if you're, like, we talked about the single responsibility principle. Um, the single responsibility of this component is to do layout, and I would say when you're doing layouting of components, JavaScript is just the wrong tool. So if you're doing, trying to do layouts using JavaScript, uh, it's, like, CSS is just way better for that specific use case. So I would uh, say for this kind of component, we don't want to use JavaScript. The last component that we have is this wrapper component, which wraps our HTML table and the, the column headers that we defined before and kind of ties it all together. So we want to make it work. I kind of spoilered this in the first two components that we want to wrap our input elements in a form. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to wrap our table and our column headers in a form um, so that the user can then submit user filter queries. So what will this look like? Um, here you can see you're typing some different things in the filter fields, and then we submit, and it filters it. We can also sort it, like hit the sort arrow, um, and it will sort our column. And the thing is, is this is, this is u interactive. This provides um, interactivity for the user, but there's not any JavaScript at this point. Um, uh, we do notice that there might be a slight flickering um, between when we submit it and when it returns. That's because it's actually a brand new HTML form that's returned from the server. Um, uh, yeah, so we can keep that in mind. For CSS here, I'm going to use the same rule as I use for the filter component, that in pretty much every application I design, I already have CSS for dealing with tables. So I'm going to put that off until um, the future and someone else can make it pretty. But we can make it better. So I talked about there might be this slight flicker when we submit our form and then uh, it returns from the server. Uh, we can improve this in JavaScript by submitting our forms asynchronously with JavaScript and then replacing the DOM that we get from the server, uh, replacing our table body that we get from the server with um, the result. We replace our table body with the table body that we get from the server. There we go. So how can we do this? We can write a helper function to serialize our form as a URL. Um, you can write this function, or you can copy a small helper function from somewhere else. There's different uh, implementations. And then we can write a, a function, a submit function form, uh, a function submit, uh, which will serialize this form uh, as a URI and then use the fetch API um, to retrieve it from the server. And uh, once it's come back, we can unpack that response and get the text out, so we'll get the HTML. This is only considering the happy path of uh, the application, because adding too much code to slides is never a good idea. Um, so the next step we want to, to do is we want to replace the T body with the t uh, from our element with the T body that we get from the server. 
So we can use this function, we can define a function template to DOM, which will take an HTML string, pack, um, put that in within a template uh, element in our document, and the template element is one of the uh, four JavaScript web component specifications, which just gives us an area where we can put any um, HTML code that will not interact or mess with our uh, web application. You don't see it. So we can use this functionality to be able to, uh, the HTML string, we can turn this into an HTML element in essence. Um, and then once, so we call that function then to extract the tbody element from the HTML response that we got from the server. Uh, and then we can replace our tbody with the HTML of the new tbody from the server. We can then uh, override the default submit behavior so we can define our own function. What do we want to do when the form is submitted? Um, we want to do exactly what we said before. We want to call the submit form that we defined, and then once we receive the HTML from the server, we want to replace our tbody with that from the server. Um, and we define a function to initialize this behavior. It's the initialize submit function, and this will uh, listen to the submit f um, event in our form uh, and call our submit function instead of the, pre the default submit behavior, um, so we prevent the default behavior. The question then is, who calls this initialize function? I said before, the JavaScript is a part of our web component. Um, and historically, when we wrote HTML, um, like when we, when we added HTML um, dynamically on our client, we had to know both the HTML markup that we wanted to add, and we had to know like what function, what JavaScript function we want to call in order to initialize it. So these were separate things. Uh, however, with the custom element specification, which is the most important part of the JavaScript web component specifications, in my opinion, um, you can come up and talk to me about that after the talk if you have questions. But um, the, the custom elements allow me to define a custom HTML element that I can add to my HTML. Um, and then also, with this custom element, I can also define how what JavaScript functionality does this component need? Um, the browser will then take care of the initialization for me. So what does this look like? I can write a JavaScript class, like the class tabella, which extends HTML, the, an a HTML element. And in the connected callback method of my class, I can call this initialize submit function that I defined before. So I can call any JavaScript functionality that I need. Um, and then this will be called as soon as um, my uh, tabella element, I define it with the custom elements defined, tabella um, as being the tabella class that I defined. And then once this uh, tabella element appears in, in the DOM, uh, the browser will take care of calling connected callback. The other thing I think is really cool about custom elements is that it adds a scope to JavaScript. I mean, that's actually JavaScript. But when I, def when I extend the HTML element, um, the this variable, which historically in JavaScript and scoping, I was always like, I don't actually know what this is, and so I'm just going to not use it because I don't want to do something wrong. But now, this is bound to the actual HTML element itself, which means that I um, have access to the native Java API, JavaScript API scope for my, um, for my tabella class. So we can see this in the get form function uh, that I can call this query selector form, and that will do exactly what I think it does, um, which is it will look inside my scope as a custom element, and it will find uh, a um, find the form element. I can also improve my component to uh, make it more dynamic by triggering submits myself when I think they should be uh, they should be triggered. For instance, when I click on these radio buttons, I don't. I can think um, maybe I want to send this submit directly to the server and not wait for the user to submit. And I can do that by adding a listener to the change um, event to submit the form directly. Um, and then I can also, when, um, I can also add an event listener to the key up event, which when I type in the box, um, then I 
uh, I can perform this filtering query for the user directly instead of waiting for them to submit. Um, but here with the key up element, I don't actually uh, key up event. I don't actually want to send it every time they hit a key. Um, I don't want to send an HTML HTTP request. Instead, I want to wait a while until um, until the users stop typing, and I can do that by using a, like a debounce function, um, which will just wait a little while um, until uh, until 300 milliseconds or something has gone by, and at that point. Uh, if the, I can assume the user stopped typing, and then I can perform this HTTP request. There are other things I can do. I can replace the whole tabella element instead of just the T body for added flexibility, for instance. Um, with this tabella component, often we'd expect something like a pagination component to be there because I don't want to load all 20,000 results from my database. I only want to load 25. And if this is included in my tabella component, um, I can replace that whole block of code instead of just uh, inside the table itself. I can also integrate with the history API so the user can go back and forth in their search history. I can also instantiate the tabella on the client so that these filter fields are added dynamically um, if the user hasn't added or if the server hasn't added them themselves uh, yet. But here I would say we still want to pay attention to the single responsibility. Uh, principle, so if someone comes with this great idea for this new functionality, we have to think, does this belong in this component, or do I want to add another component that will perform this, or will do this functionality better? So this is what the end result looks like. I can, when I hit the um, sort arrow, the, um, the columns will, will be sorted, uh, and I can also type in the boxes, and it will provide a dynamic filtering of the columns. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, this, uh, and so that's what we can see in summary. We have HTML that work, that our components composed of HTML to make it work for all users and be accessible for all users. We've made it pretty. We've also added, made it possible for our users to easily extend the components so that they can make it look like their, um, uh, their user interface. And with JavaScript, we've improved our component to make it faster and make it more dynamic. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Betsy. This is for you.